Video games are pretty great, but did you ever want to play more than one at once? I'm not talking about separate programs or having an idle game running on your phone. I mean playing a game that smushed several genres into one. Well, check out Rise to Ruins, a game where you play as a god, playing a village builder, playing a tower defense, playing a roguelike. While each aspect isn't as fleshed out as it would be were it standing alone in its own genre, this is by no means a shallow game and each piece comes together to make something greater than the sum of its parts. Rise to Ruins has all the trappings of a typical village simulator. You're responsible for a group of people whose needs must be met, resources are gathered and refined, and the town must be planned out and upgraded to increase its capacities, efficiencies, and defenses. There's no raising armies or battle tactics. Surviving involves the creation of a death maze that controls and eliminates the flow of monsters coming into your base. Though, if you so choose, you could get pretty personal with your smiting. Despite your powers, the control you have over the world is muffled, influencing actions and events rather than giving direct orders. And you'll be failing a lot. There are so many ways to die. Weak defenses, collapse of food supply, or maybe just bad luck. But losing doesn't matter. You'll restart again and again, fixing previous missteps, getting slightly further in your quest to tame a region, and eventually, the world. There's a lot to this game, but first I want to mention that the making of it was a one-man show. Raymond Doer, Doer quit his safe, reliable corporate job to take a chance on an idea that had no guarantee of success. Relatable. Long story short, this has a happy ending. Indie dev success story, you love to see it. Creative projects are an awful lot of work for a single person to shoulder. It can be hard to accurately translate your ideas from brain to paper. Or processor. So how does the game present itself? There's a lot of visual wiggle room in these types of games. You can go realistic or abstract, but the most important thing is clarity. And for the most part, Rise to Ruins is very clean. Buildings are distinguishable and villagers have different, customizable colors depending on their job. Easy to see what's what and not so bland that you feel like you're playing Microsoft Excel. The simple top-down pixel art has a lot of charm and keeps things identifiable, which is good because there's a lot to keep track of, so the ability to know what's happening at a glance can prevent players from feeling overwhelmed. Despite the stylistic simplicity, it's easy for things to get lost. At maximum view distance, monsters and villagers are very small on screen, and there are a ton of particle effects. It's quite pretty. A lot of the people-shaped entities blend together, and it can be easy to miss the ones that are less than corporeal. Not to mention, a lot of the sharpness and clarity falls away when you zoom in. Everything is squares. It's not hideous, but it can feel crowded, especially with all the particles. The further out the camera is, the better everything looks, and honestly, the particle effects are on point. They do contribute to a lot of visual clutter, but they add character and physicality to the game. Magic flitters and swirls, clouds disperse, and blood splatters. You can tell a lot of effort was put into making these pixels dance. It didn't have to be this way. The lighting is also well done. Dark is dark, and when it's nighttime and raining, it can be almost impossible to tell what's going on outside of lit areas. Thankfully, you're given plenty of tools to mitigate this. Buildings have light sources, you can build torches, and your cursor and friendly entities slightly illuminate the areas around them. Not to mention your god powers. Darkness in video games can be a tough balancing act. On the one hand, it makes sense that not everything is visible. On the other, adding a layer of obscurity for the sole purpose of dispelling it can be tedious. Having to push a button every 30 seconds just to see what you're doing is annoying. If it gets too obnoxious, then up goes the gamma. But I think there's a good balance here. Rarely it gets dark to the point where you can't tell what's going on, and when it does, it won't last forever. Besides, your buildings generate enough light that unless you're sloppy with your defenses, enemies won't surprise you. As for how the game sounds, the soundtrack is reminiscent of games like Stardew Valley and Minecraft. It's going for those cozy vibes. I feel like it kind of misses the mark though. I wouldn't say it's bad, but it's uninspiring. It's simple, it's plain, it's basic. I don't know, you can see what it's going for, but it falls short. And it will stick in your head for the wrong reasons. The library of songs is in no way big enough to carry itself through the many, many hours you can put into this game. Again, I know this was made by one man. Solo developers wear a lot of hats and not everyone is a master composer. But here, you've heard one song and you've heard them all. That's fine. 
This game is a fantastic excuse to fill your ears with a podcast or audiobook. The soundscape, like the music, is very soft. Flutes, chimes, gentle horns. It's all very pleasant. But there's a problem. The audio can lull you into a false sense of security. It can be hard to tell when there's an emergency. Things go bad quickly and quietly. You will be caught with your pants down. Similar games let you know immediately when there's a problem, and a lot of these barks and alarms are permanently etched into the gamer hive mind. It's very easy to miss the warnings here. Even disasters like earthquakes and meteors sound so doughy and muted. I don't think the audio accurately conveys how dangerous those can be. I don't think the audio is good at conveying danger, period. Though you can't say it's not consistent with the rest of the game's presentation. The sights and sounds move in lockstep together and makes for a very cohesive product. Wait, I've heard this before. Bring back my bunny to me. Of course, we have to look at the settings before we start the game. You know the rules, mores is betters. What we have here is pretty sparse. To be fair, it's not like this game needs a ton of options. At least you can change the keybinds. Oh, and resizing the interface can be pretty handy. Are you still here? Cool, let's get started. The way the game was meant to be played. The first thing you see after the difficulty menu is the world map. It's a big island with a bunch of biomes and you can start anywhere. It should be obvious which areas will have an easier start. The more north you go on the island, the higher the average temperature, which matters for things like how fast plants grow, water supply, and how quickly your villagers overheat or freeze. Let's avoid the lava fields for now and settle somewhere cooler. Map selected, village center placed. Okay, now what? The learning curve is more of a learning cliff. You're dropped into the game with your only help being pop-up text tutorials which can generously be described as functional. I didn't come here to read. Now how do I play the game? Actually building the village is pretty straightforward. You plop down a blueprint on the grid and if you have enough resources your people will shuffle everything to the build site and start building. But the pile of stuff you start with runs out quickly so the sooner you get gathering the better. Surprise surprise you'll need food, water, wood, and stone. Mark off these resources for gathering using these buttons down here. Wait why can't I select food? You're telling me these people need a farm to pull vegetables out of the ground? It's a turnip just grab it. Workers will only gather from marked resources, and until you have dedicated harvesters, it's best to select whatever's closest to your building projects, because of how jobs work. This isn't an RTS, you don't actually have any direct control over your villagers. Their actions can be influenced to a degree using a priority system and assigning jobs with more dedicated roles that increase the efficiency of the town as a whole. Still, it can feel like herding cats. For example, builders build buildings. Wow. But a more accurate job description would be general labor. You see, they'll only build the buildings if everything's all ready to go. If you're out of lumber, these workers walk all the way over to the marked off trees to cut them down, then transport the wood to the build site, drop it off, and finally start building. Each builder will do that set of tasks in that order on repeat until the job is done. Sounds fine. What's the problem exactly? Well, it's terribly inefficient and doesn't take into account the time people need to be people. When one of your villagers needs, drops too low, they'll have to spend time eating, drinking, or whatever else, to raise that stat so they can muster the willpower to work another day. Should one of these needs arise in the middle of a task, then tough titties boss, I'm going on break. And it seems as though the game saves whatever work this villager was doing for them until they get back, so a group of workers stopping all at once can cost you precious time. The entire process can be sped up by having specialized labor, lumberjacks to cut and stockpile wood, and organizers that transport resources to and from these stockpiles to construction sites, lightening the workload on your laborers so they can focus on building houses, and the future. On top of the job system, there's a priority list that tells your people what they should be working on, you know, when they're not fucking around. But if you don't have all that background support running, or there's a job that silently takes top priority, like destroying terrain, it can feel more like a suggestion list. Sometimes, to make absolutely sure everyone is working on what you need, you have to pause everything except that one specific task until it's done. Even then, from time to time, you'll have to take a more hands-on approach to your village. There is a healthy list of god powers you can use to make life easier, conjure materials from thin air, transport the materials, change the weather, and many, many options for smiting. How often you're able to use your powers depends on how much influence you have. Influence recharges slowly over time, but there are ways to replenish it quickly. Your base amount depends on how hard your people believe in you. Growing the faith is as simple as having witnesses to your divine acts. Bask in my glory. Performing miracles publicly and often starts a feedback loop which allows you to perform more miracles publicly and often. Often. More faith is always better. And if it starts getting a little atheistic out there, well, 
Nothing a little fire and brimstone can't fix. Losing influence greatly diminishes your ability to solve problems. Not only that, but non-believers will become scared and confused when they see you floating rocks around, wasting even more time panicking for no reason. No reason. If things are still taking too long despite your works, you can turn up the game's speed, which is a bit of a trade-off as you're able to make more actions more precisely at a slower speed, and wasted time is doubly felt in this game. It's not a simple city builder, you're not alone, and you need to protect your people. Corruption appears on the map at the beginning of the match and slowly creeps over the entire area while constantly spawning monsters. At first, they only attack at night, but it's just a matter of time before things get crazy. While the flow of enemies takes a while to ramp up, you do want to raise your defenses as quickly as possible. It's it's possible to arm and armor your villagers, but they're not soldiers. The best way to protect your town is by building a death maze, finding what direction the attacks are coming from and making that space as dangerous as possible. It's a build your own tower defense. There are several wall types, tower types, ammo types, and damage types that you can mix and match to create a conga line of death that ideally never gets past the gates. Make sure to keep a path open to your juicy city center. A full wall off leads to chaos as enemies attempt to smash their way into your base. Actually, putting up walls can be a bit of a pain. You see See, you're only allowed to place buildings within your territory, which is expanded by placing buildings or torches at the edge of your territory. Now, this area that you need to manually expand can be cut off by line of sight, preventing the completion of placed plans. Walls block line of sight. Can you see the issue here? You need to put up the outermost wall first and build inwards. If you didn't know this or didn't incorporate torches into your walls, you might end up blocking off blueprints that won't ever get built until you knock a hole in your own defenses, which comes with another set of problems. All of this could be avoided if there was a way to plan out your villages. The best that you can do is put down a blueprint and then pause construction. But this eats up a building slot, which you may be short of, especially in the early game. And if you max out this limit, you don't even get to see the blueprint. You could just remember the dimensions and placement of what you want to build, but who has the brain power for that? I get why there's a building cap so you can't spam out towers and trivialize the game, but I don't understand why there's no way to sim your city. The building limit won't stifle you as much as I may have implied, and it's fairly easy to raise this cap. Plus, you should be able to win way before reaching the maximum slots. Also, you can't rotate buildings either, because reasons. These aren't game-breaking issues, they're just inconvenient. Because time is precious and mistakes compound quickly. Losing a villager or misplacing a building can feel like a catastrophic slip-up. It might even warrant a reset right then and there. Time spent undoing the oopsie could be better spent somewhere else. Don't even get me started on if nomads don't show up. The fastest way to get more people is to have an attractive home with plenty of room and extra food. But if you're unlucky, too bad. Sometimes people just don't show up, no matter how coquettishly you flash your pantries. And if you're stuck with a dozen people for half a season, you're gonna be spread really thin. The native population does reproduce, but at a rate that rivals South Korea, and this isn't Frostpunk, so you won't be getting any work out of those kids for a while. The combination of not knowing what to do and a splash of bad RNG means you can get screwed and not know it for a couple hours. Also, I sorta of mentioned it before, but the game isn't the greatest at giving feedback. This little flashy flash along the edge of the screen lets you know when damage is being taken, but it also flashes when cooks butcher animals for their day job, so uh, I don't know. Eventually you get the hang of noticing when things are or can go wrong, but until you get to that point, it can feel like the game isn't holding up its end of the couch. The interface can also be a bit obtuse. Buttons, graphs, data sheets, information that is totally not explained. Get out of here. And you could be doing everything right and having great luck when suddenly rocks fall and everyone dies. Random events be random. Yeah, I get it, it can add a little spice to your playthrough, but when it happens, it's just... It's bullshit. Like, I'm busy and now I gotta put out these fires? I'm not omnipotent. It just feels bad to lose because of a dice roll. There is a silver lining, however. You're supposed to fail. It actually makes you stronger. Every time you play, you accrue experience, which you can use to unlock chests on the overworld map that give you permanent bonuses. These bonuses range from useless to niche to the game will never be the same. Every time you restart, you get a little wiser and a little further. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a big fan of iteration. When I got the game, I must have spent oh, hours on the first 15 minutes of a map restarting over and over again to find a good build order and placements. With all the freedom you're offered in terms of maps and starting areas, there's the potential for no two games to be the same. The biggest issue with the game stems from 
from personal expectations. If you're looking for a satisfying ending, better luck elsewhere. There's no point to the game. But Fox, you could say that all games are pointless. Why are you here? If you have hours to burn, the game is fantastic. If there really is no ending, not even to the individual zones. You'll just scale to the point where your defenses are impenetrable and any damage taken is automatically repaired, and more and more people show up only to be sent to other zones to kickstart the next village. Given how much of the game there is, and how many times you need to restart, I can only imagine that if you clear the whole map, Raymond comes to your house to congratulate you personally and escort you to the asylum. Rise to Ruins is a fun game that you can lose a lot of time to. It looks good, it sounds okay, and you can tell a lot of love was put into it. While the steep learning curve can be a bit intimidating, demolishing your save and climbing over the rubble gets you a little further every time. The game trusts that you'll figure it out, and that's where most of the fun lies. At least it's worth a try. You'll know it's for you within that two-hour refund window. If you do enjoy it and keep it, you'll definitely get your money's worth, even at full price. There's so much here to sink your teeth into, even if there's no satisfying ending. Thanks for watching, and a special thanks to my supporters and channel members. Because of you, I have the means to make videos like this possible. If you like what you saw, subscribing and sharing the video goes a long way. Becoming a channel member goes even further. The longer I'm able to do this, the more weird and interesting games I can bring to your attention. Some might even be good. Or, if you have a game you'd like reviewed, I take suggestions at my email and on my Discord server. Link's in the description. Maybe I'll start answering questions in the outro too, because that's fun. Thanks again. Until next time.